Hello, everybody. Thanks for. Totally spontaneous. Thank you for the for the genuine support. We're here to talk PowerShell, uh, not just be friendly and clap. So today we're going to be learning about building and learning a little bit about cross-platform TUIs. Um, let's get started with who I am. Now some of you might know me. I know I'm friends with a handful of you, but I'm a father of two. That's pretty important to me. It takes up a lot of uh, great time and energy, and it's one of my favorite things about life. Uh, PowerShell advocate, super into it, been into PowerShell for a long time. It's been really impactful for my life, and I'm super happy to be involved and be able to contribute to a conference like this. Um, I co-host the PowerShell podcast with Jordan Hammond. Yeah. Great guy, great guy. And in 2018, I got the Summit Scholarship, which is pretty cool, and it's awesome to see that now there's a lot more scholarships and a lot of awesome new people being injected into the community. So what's the goal of this talk? Um, just show off TUIs and PowerShell and how to build your own. Give you some ideas. From my assessment of things, there's a lack of TUI development in PowerShell. I think that what we'll see today, there's some really cool projects that can get you started pretty far without a, a huge investment necessarily. And uh, I'm hoping to inspire some people, get some more projects, get some more people contributing and, and seeing what they can create. Because there might be some better developers here than I. I'll say that. So what's the plan? We're going to go over the basics of TUIs. Maybe I'll explain what they are at some point. Uh, we'll explore terminal.gui. I've, I've teased that a few times. We'll cover what that is. Go over a couple of examples of kind of some code you can maybe get started with on your own. Um, we'll develop a couple simple TUIs. Look at some advanced controls. I have a lot of controls that I have slides for. I don't know if we'll be able to cover it all. Uh, this is the type of, well, we'll get into that later. So what and why TUIs? What are these TUIs? It sounds really funny, looks a little bit fancy. There's the UI element. Well, a TUI is a text or terminal-based user interface, um, or like a command interface kind of thing. But we call them TUIs. Um, and they're pretty awesome. They've been around for a super long time, way longer uh, than you might think. And they're kind of coming back, in my opinion. You know, retro things kind of come back. Uh, I think the TUIs are, are pretty enjoyable for me. There's a lot of benefits of them. They're lightweight, right? Not a ton of data being sent. There's some environments where you don't have access to a graphical environment. Very helpful. It's fast and efficient. Um, like I said, it's super nostalgic and fun. I mean, with this talk, we're not securing Azure. We're not uh, implementing new resources. We're designing TUIs, so it's a little bit fun. You know, uh, can definitely add some value and in improve your tools and stuff, but it's also just enjoyable. And one of my favorite things about PowerShell is how enjoyable it is. Um, and in my experience with this talk and going through it, it was a great way to work on my skills and improve them. And it's really fun to develop something that has a graphical component. It just feels more interactive than just the kind of code thing and just seeing text return, um, which I really enjoy because in IT, I, there's a lot of times for me a lack of some kind of output you can see. The more of that, the more enjoyable. Like I mentioned, the GUI isn't always available. And for me, these days, I spend a ton of time in the terminal. And the PowerShell team is investing a lot of resources into that area. And I think that TUIs fit quite well with that. And I, I think we're fortunate that we're empowered with some projects and modules uh, to get us started in that regard. And for me, this is huge. Less context switching. I get so distracted all the time. If I do a, a get help um, dash show window, I get distracted. It goes behind other windows. I see all my other browser tabs in the background. Um, so I like to try when I can to streamline my setup to work against some things that I struggle with. Um, and TUIs are fantastic for that. OK, so TUIs and PowerShell. So there's more of a manual approach that you can take. And there was a, a fantastic talk last year by Mark Wilkinson about writing his own CLI tool. And he talked about a lot of the challenges that you run into with uh, keeping the graphics on the screen, with looping, all sorts of things. Um, and that's a totally fine approach. But for me, it was a bit too much code. And so whenever I saw terminal.gui, 
this project that makes it easier, and there's also a Microsoft project I'll cover later, I thought, wow, this is an entry point I'm more interested in because I feel like I could tell other people to do it and not have it be a huge investment of their time, and uh, maybe they would be hesitant to take that on. Okay, what is terminal.gui? Well, it went by an, a different name before, which was GUI CS, which you may have heard of, maybe not. But terminal.gui, I guess it kind of turned into that at some point in time. And it's a toolkit for building rich console apps for .NET, .NET Core, and Mono that works on Windows, the Mac, and Linux and Unix. Um, so it's .NET Core, which is great. And you can create TUIs quickly and easily using PowerShell without needing to learn complex UI um, frameworks. Also, without having to write a ton of code because they've implemented a lot of the things that you would run into with the user interface for you. Um, and thanks to Adam Driscoll. He's the one who initially introduced this to the PowerShell community. He has some great blogs on it. He made a couple tools, which we'll cover later. Um, I really appreciate him. He's done a great job historically with bringing developer type stuff, traditional developer stuff, into the PowerShell world and making it accessible for us. So hopefully we'll take the next step here and, and do some hands-on interaction with it. So before we dive super deep into terminal.gui, we're going to explore something that's built on top of it. And to me, this is my recommended entry to TUIs. I don't, it's quick to get running uh, using this module rather than learning all of terminal.gui, but they, they kind of work in tandem. So, like I said, it's built with uh, terminal.gui. That's a great start. It's very similar. It has a command very similar to out grid view called out console grid view. Um, it's very similar, but you just don't have that context switching. You just stay in the terminal. And yeah, there's some other cool things that are built with this. That's not very uh, readable, but let's look at some stuff. We back? Oh, my background. <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot that uh, you all don't know what that is. All right, let's see. I was like, am I doing something here? <laughs> okay, cool. So, yeah, to get started with the console GUI tools, and can everyone read this? Should I go a little bit bigger? A little bit bigger? We'll do. How's that? Okay, so we have, get it installed. Great way to get started. Um, this is a Microsoft module, as you can see. Now, I mentioned doing some quick tools, right? Uh, we can look at terminal GUI. It's a lot more complex later. But this is just using the module. We just use some simple filter examples. Here's one where we're going to look through my music folder. We're going to select a single um, MP3 player. And then we're going to play it. Pretty simple. Boom, boom. There's a couple down here. Uh, and for some of these examples, I'll do them in VS Code. And for others, I'll probably use the terminal. Um, but spacebar to select, press enter, and you'll see. Love it. All right. Another great example, similar kind of filtering thing, is looking for the about topics and help. So we have a fantastic docs team at PowerShell. Uh, and there are some fantastic docs that are worth exploring. And the about topics are ones that kind of explain concepts and things like that that may not be otherwise apparent. And I highly recommend people who maybe don't have as much exposure start exploring those. Maybe you have people on your team or you yourself could benefit from this type of thing. And very simply, we have a 2E tool right here that will get help, all the about topics, grab the name, let you pick one, and then shows you the help in the terminal. Grabbing all the about topics. Boom. There's a bunch. Oops. There's a bunch. A ton, a ton. Now, you see that little thing at the top? Filter. Now, that's sweet. I'm going to press tab right here. And let's look for like variables, I think sounds OK. There's some automatic variables, preference variables, remote variables. Let's just pick one. And there you go. It, it returned the help for it. Um, simple enough. I am a huge fan of this type of tool where you don't have to learn anything other than just one command. Ideally, you know PowerShell and, and understand the pipeline and can fit it in there. And now all of a sudden, you have an interactive tool. And we're going to take it a little bit of a step further, because um, ideally, you'd put this in a function. And maybe there's some other ways we can take it uh, to the next level. Simple example. You've probably seen this a bunch of times. Filtering on processes and then stop. Um, we don't have to run that. I'm sure you can imagine what that looks like. But this is where it gets juicy and very cool to me. 
and where it ties in with, I think, some of the bigger pictures of the PowerShell team and PS Readline and really awesome tools to change how you do things. So this right here is a, a couple, it's a function that will allow you to press F7 when combined with PS Readline to view the history or shift F7 for your global history. So um, I have that set up in terminal. And is this visible? Good, okay. Better? We good? Okay, so like I said, F7, which is just going to do the, okay, I ran some commands and stuff. I definitely was testing some things. I'm going to press escape because I don't want to run that. Um, I'm going to press shift F7 to view my PS read line global history, and that's a lot more. So uh, the command I like using is this. I'm sorry. Super helpful, though. Um, when you tie this in with PS Readline, this is one example. Maybe there's some other ways you can augment your workflow and tie things in where you're using hotkeys to initiate things. And uh, I really like this approach that it's so easy to get a large return on your investment. I didn't have to code any of this stuff. I didn't have to draw the boxes or update things or make it so you can select or filter. I just added one command and installed it, um, which to me is super cool. Get out of that back here. Um, and I have a link to that in my slides to where you can get this. This is from the some module or some project publicly. I think Microsoft had it on their thing. All right, Shift F5 to resume where we were. Sweet. Looks like we went back a slide, but awesome. That's one project. And that's, like I said, the simple entry point where if nothing else, I hope you take that away. You check out that. Maybe you add it to your workflow. You explore it a little bit. You maybe find some use cases. Um, but I think it's such a, a fantastic way to be creative with PowerShell. You get a ton of value back. Now, we have a very cool project, also by Adam Driscoll, PS Edit. Um, has anyone here heard of PS Edit before? It's Pretty cool project, I, I believe. Uh, shout out to him majorly for that. But it is an editor inside of PowerShell. It's cross-platform and all the other stuff. It's built on terminal.gui, which we will uh, explore more. And the benefit of this compared to alternatives like Vim or whatever kind of things you got is you just install module, right? There's, there's nothing else. Ideally, uh, if you're using PowerShell a lot, that's kind of part of your workflow. And this is just an extension of that. For those environments when you need to make a sh quick alter to like a TXT, maybe uh, some other file, you can do that very easily. So, so one thing that I like to do a lot is make small changes to my profile. And a lot of time I'll run code profile, and it'll open up in VS Code. But this is another valid. Oh. <laughs> Okay, I'll hit escape on that. So do we like that little background image, the horse? <laughs> it's a little cursed, I'll give you that. Um, all right, let's just do this, bingo bongo. Oh, we gotta get zoomed in again. All right, so it's show PS editor profile. Within my editor, I can edit this file. And you can see I have some stuff set here. Uh, some simple functions, it's my profile. Um, but often I'll make small changes to it, and this is a fantastic way to do it within your editor. Uh, no saves needed, but there's a full menu here, it's clickable. Um, I'm personally a fan of some TUIs that don't require clicks, and it's more like a mouse type situation, I'm sorry, a keyboard type situation. Um, but very cool project, and I, to me it shows the upper limits of what can kind of be done. Um, and that's the type of thing that I think is a little bit above what I can come up with. Um, but hopefully by showing this to the community, we can get some other cool stuff. Um, Shift F5, get back to where we were. Awesome. So there's a bunch of cool features, right? IntelliSense, syntax highlighting, format on save, script execution, error view, uh, and syntax error view, and that's the GitHub link. And it's open source, so if you do run into issues or whatever, file some issues, communicate. Uh, ideally, that's another great takeaway I'd love to have here is we have more people communicating about it. If there's an issue that's affecting us, let's communicate and maybe get the docs updated or we could even take the step ourselves and, and maybe contribute some code and get things working in that way. Okay, so I showed you how to install that one module to get set up, but we need to explore how you can get started quickly. 
uh, on your own. Now, a great, oops, a great way to get the module is, like I said earlier, getting the Microsoft PowerShell Console GUI tools because it ships with the DLL that we need for terminal.gui. And that's terminal.gui.dll. Uh, another note is that if you are trying to run these in VS Code, um, the short, what's that? I thought I heard somebody say, um. oh, okay. Uh, if you're developing in VS Code, Control Q by default, which is how you quit out of terminal.gui, um, it's the quit sequence, it isn't, it's captured by VS Code as like the quick, uh, quick open view. So if you add this to your JSON profile, um, you will not have that experience. You'll be able to control Q and quit out. And I don't know where I prefer developing in, whether it's the terminal, whether it's running it in that window in VS Code. Uh, they kind of have their trade-offs. And uh, I like the terminal so much, I don't mind running things out of there and resizing the box. It's better than just a little bottom window of VS Code. Let's go look at some of that code. All right, you're coming with me here. All right, whoops. We're gonna open up starter.ps1. All right. Cool. So, right at the top, I use this using namespace. Um, I really enjoy this because it makes it so you don't have to type the full name uh, of whatever class you're using. Uh, and to me, so the other way it would look if you weren't using that would be. And to me, just my simple, my simple self, that's a little bit too much for me to read. My eyes kind of go a little wonky, and I have a hard time reading what should be simple code. So I like using the using statement, namespace, and with this. Um, the first thing we need to do is add the DLL, and this code I regularly uh, have in all my things, and I, it's a great way to get started with it. Application new, this is the class that does everything, um, or at least gets things started, draws the host, kicks off, um, a lot of stuff, so when I add that, then you can create a window pretty easily, right? Just window new, and then it has properties, and we can alter those properties, and we set the title here. Um, you can add extra code here, uh, because this is just kind of the starter, right? There's not much that's gonna happen here other than a window, then you're going to add the window and run it. So let's give this a try. Oops, yeah, that's a really great window there. Okay. Simple enough. It says window title, that's all we really did. Uh, but this starter code I use every single time I try and show off a new thing or, or work on it. Uh, it just saves a lot of time there. Another thing that catches people a lot is shutting down. So there is a shutdown function on application, uh, which I can go back and show you real quick. Oh, this alt tab experience is something, huh? Right there. If you forget this, you're not going, your GUI won't clean up after itself. And it causes issues and it causes confusion. Like you saw Jeff Hicks asked uh, Adam Driscoll and I about it because he ran into it. I ran into it. I have seen other people on the internet posting about running into it. So if you're, just use the starter and make sure you include shutdown. All right, Terminal GUI Designer. Another project by, you guessed it, Adam Driscoll. He's been busy. <laughs> He's been busy. Um, let's check that out real quick. It's a TUI designer. He has all of the, uh, oops, sorry about that. All right, yeah, he has uh, the toolbox including all of the views and controls that you can use um, within it and it's a drag and drop type interface. All right, you can add your buttons. I personally don't usually use this. Um, it's okay, but I find that if I know what my TUI is gonna look like, I can just kind of configure the elements myself and whatever sub windows and sub views that I'd like to have because um, this ends up adding a little bit too much boilerplate stuff for me. Um, but it's a very cool, I mean, application here. We got docs. Boom. And we're stuck in it, so hee <laughs> hee. There we go, start fresh. All right, so 
There are some struggles with it. Drag and drop is nice, like I mentioned. Um, you have to initialize it before calling show to a designer. Uh, there's an open GitHub issue for this, but this is another one of those things that's kind of a roadblock for a lot of people. Um, hopefully another takeaway from this talk is if you decide to go down this route and explore terminal.gui, you'll avoid some of these at least because uh, it can be a little frustrating when you're trying to do some stuff and that happens. Okay, let's check out out tree view. Again, another awesome contribution by Adam Driscoll. He's super into this stuff apparently. <laughs> um, but you can view objects in a tree view using terminal.gui. So let's see, I have a boom, boom. Out tree view, awesome, a lot of code here. Same kind of boilerplate up here where we add the DLL, there's an expand object function, and then out tree view, which is where we dynamically generate a tree view. You can see we initialize the application as we have before, uh, we create the top view, and there's some more stuff. We don't need to go over all this right now, we'll cover a lot of these things like terminal.gui.dim, uh, it was very confusing to me for a while, but let's go ahead and out of that, boom. Uh, we will switch to terminal for this one. Boom. Okay, so uh, this, I queried our podcast for this. I forgot to show that part at the bottom. Whoops, little shill accidentally. Uh, I went to our XML, our feed. Uh, invoke rest method, got it, and then send it to this command. Uh, I didn't write out tree view to work specifically with podcasts. It just works with dynamic objects um, dynamically. It goes through all of our properties on the XML, which are a little bit weird because it's XML. Uh, and the, yeah, it's pretty cool. You can use this for a lot of things. And to me, this shows the dynamic nature that you can generate your uh, GUIs with, or TUIs rather. Um, which is really cool. And this approach also shows why sometimes I don't like using terminal.gui um, because it's, oh, sorry, the TUI designer, because it's a little harder for the dynamic elements, at least for me visually, uh, to imagine where they're going. Yes. Oh, uh, right arrow, left arrow. Yeah, so a great question by a very funny guy. <laughs> Thank you for that though, for real. Uh, so how do you expand these? So you go up and down with up and down arrow keys, and then you push right if you want to expand an element, and right again, left to close, open. Awesome, let's go back. Okay, so that's our brief overview of some projects designed with terminal.gui. And to empower you to start developing your own, uh, at least what I'll say is what I would have liked to have had uh, and what was very helpful to me was going through these different views and really kind of understanding them. Because for me, some of this stuff is a little pushing my boundaries. I'm not as comfortable with it um, when you're dealing with a lot of these types and stuff like that and trying to like keep track of it in your mind and uh, all these controls and stuff like that. Um, but going through this, I went through the controls and kind of created some examples that were pretty helpful for me because there's a few gotchas that we'll cover as we go through this. All right, so yes, views, what are views? All vi visible elements are views. Every, it's the base class for all views. It can have zero or more nested views called subviews, right? Like in the um, out tree view example, we had many nested views dynamically generated. Um, you can add to existing views by calling the add method, which we do very frequently uh, to the window. And use get supported commands to see which commands are implemented by whatever view you're using. Also, definitely check out the docs, right? Definitely read their documentation. If you're struggling, there's so many views, so many more views than uh, I can ever cover in a day or in 90 minutes or in two hours. Uh, it's a very big project. So here's a couple examples of some views, right? Too many to actually say, a bunch. Text, menus, um, you, have your pick, which I think speaks to why this is such a beneficial module, or sorry, project for PowerShell is because all of this is written. This is a really large project compared to um, 
what I feel like I've seen before in, in the user interface space. And the fact that we can call this from PowerShell and use this is great because I'm not writing that many classes. I'm not. Uh, and the fact that this already exists, we can take advantage of it, is amazing. So what's the view? The top level view is a, is a very important view. It's common. You, there's a window in dialog, top level meaning visible top. Um, there's dialogs. Uh, it can be used to launch a new experience in your application, like a dialog kind of thing that pops up. It can be initialized with init, which initializes things. Uh, and boom, you can see adding it to the top view right there. So you don't see that? Oh, do you see it now? No, no, just right at the bottom. Yeah, no, just uh, terminal like dot application top add. A lot of our code has this, and you'll see in the sample file that I put up earlier, it has this as well. Okay, labels, super simple. They're text, right? It can be text. There's a bunch of properties we can set. Um, let's check that out real quick. Labels. Okay, same boilerplate at the top. I love using namespace like I mentioned. We get the DLL, we get the module if we need it, we get the DLL, initialize the application, get ourselves a window to work with, create a label. Not, not too complicated to create a label. Okay, we just call it to the new method and then we have one and there's a property and we can set it. Okay, and if you have uh, line returns, you can use back R, back N. Um, let's just run this and then we can look into it more because there's some more advanced stuff further down. Okay, a little wild, right? Uh, we can see why we did that in a second, but there's a label window and then there's some text in very strange order. Let's see why that could have been. Okay, we also have our label text direction set to bottom, top, right, left. That, that could be uh, causing us some issues. Let's just see. Um, yeah, I intentionally did that. I thought this was so weird. It's so cool. Think about that. If I wanted to implement putting text in all these different directions, again, too confusing for my little brain. Let me just do this and just take advantage of all the work that's already been done. Um, we, we set the width and the height of the label, which is very helpful. We'll cover that in a little bit. Window.add label. We add it to the top. We run it. And again, the most important thing, we shut down. Let's try this one more time. Bada boom. So we got rid of the little text direction, and now you can read the text, right? Back R, back in, we got some manual enters. Simple enough. They're a pretty important control to take advantage of. No, uh, you could use the hear string. I guess you were doing some fancier stuff probably, um, but I have not. Okay. Layout, again, thinking of how to lay things out in a user interface is above my pay grade. It just is. I mean, this is like, we're doing math, it feels like Sudoku, and I gotta write the language for it too. To me, um, I can string some commands together, I can write some modules, but it's kind of pushing me a little too far, um, and the time investment may not be worth it for me. But the layout is important of any interface, right? You can't just not have a layout. There has to be some form of order. So how do we go about that? Well, in terminal.gui, there's two different layout systems, right? There's a layout style property on the view. There's absolute, where you can set the absolute values of it where it actually is. And then there's computed, where you can take advantage of a lot of very helpful things to uh, locate and, and set the layout and dimensions and things like that. So. See this. So first there is the POS type, which I was confused. When I read POS, I didn't think position in my brain. I'm like, this is just some fancy programmer stuff, no clue what's really going on. It looks like it has to do with like placing things, but you know, again, my brain didn't connect POS equals position. Um, yeah, it allows you to set the position of your views. You can make it uh, absolute positioning with an integer. You can make it a percentage of the parent's view side, like 50% say you want two views, 50% each, simple enough. Uh, you can center it, and you can reference the position of other views, meaning you have a view, you have a window here, you wanna put something to the right of it, 
you can refer to that without having to do anything other than just setting the location. Um, boom. There's also dim. And that was another one where I was like, what is dim? What's going on here? This is, again, <laughs> I'm just not a developer, I guess. I mean, <laughs> dim, it just means dimension. That really got me for a while. Um, just, just the simple things. When there's so many things that are kind of confusing at once, uh, for me, it, it really hinders how fast I can do things and how willing I am to take on uh, new things and actually see a project through. So hopefully you don't get confused by dim. But it allows you to set the dimensions, right? The width and the height. And similar to the other, you can make it absolute or you can make it a percentage, which is pretty cool. All right, let's open up a, some code real quick before we get too into this. We'll go back to where we were looking earlier. Are we here? OK, cool. Boom. OK, so let's look at some of those dimensions. Whoa. So we had that label. Remember that thing with the text? We set the width to fill. We set the dimensions to fill, and that is applied to the width. Same thing with the height. Very helpful. Just, gosh, I, I watched the, the talk last year on how to kind of do this thing by yourself, uh, and it's not this easy. It's a lot more code than just that right there. Um, did I have any other? That's just the dimension. Let's see what's next. Awesome. Dialogues. So dialogues are a type of window that is centered and contains one or more buttons. And it can be run modally, meaning like kind of on top and takes control thing. Um, let's take a look at some of those. Yeah, one of my favorite takeaways from doing this talk and putting it together is having all these examples to copy paste and like build together because typing it from scratch, it's not as easy. <laughs> I'm just putting it in there. Um, but awesome, this is simple. Message box, query, just says something and there's a message inside of it. Let us see. Simple enough. And you can see for this one, I didn't add it to the top. Because um, this is a modal type thing. It just pops up. You don't have to. Awesome. File dialogs. Another one, this kind of is about as exciting to me as out console grid view. Because you get so much for so little. If you have tools or things like that that have saved dialogs, this can be pretty useful to add. Um, to use, you can use it for both opening and saving files. It's a pretty great UX for no code. You don't have to code almost any of this, and you get a very cool experience. Um, I don't even know if I were to ask myself how many lines of code would it take to design and implement this myself. Uh, more than I would be willing to do, being honest. Yeah, <laughs> a few thousand, James said. Uh, Right, yep. <laughs> Let's check out this. All right, same kind of boilerplate. We initiate it. We have an open dialog to open a PowerShell script. We set some properties on it. Again, definitely got to check out the documentation. There's a lot of useful properties, potentially. A lot. You might not use them all the time, but there's probably more than you might expect at first glance. Um, you see I have the directory path set to my scripts folder, and I'm just going to select a script. And at the end of it, you'll see I, uh, oops, I'm going to not open up VS Code for this one. But I output it with write host, um, and we'll cover that in a second. Let's run this. OK, simple enough. Actually, for this one, I'm going to switch to here. Cool. Simple enough. We'll do a out speech synthesizer. I've never used any of these scripts. I just downloaded them, so I would have a couple. All right. And there you go. You see it says, you selected C users, blah, 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 which is useful because we need to get what the user selected out of it sometimes. But you'll notice I had to do something kind of strange here. Not that strange, but I had to call the dialog file path, and then I had to cast it to string. Yeah, we'll cover that later, why we have to do that. Um, 
Yeah. All right, another pretty useful thing is keyboard input handling. Every view has a focus view, and only one view can have the focus. You can use tab and shift tab to move between the different views. Um, and then there's keyboard processing, which, like it says here, goes like this hotkey processing. So those are hotkeys that you set. Then there's regular processing, which is just uh, the enter, the escape key, the regular processing of events. And then there's cold key, um, which is uh, escape and return with the default action. Um, definitely recommend reading the conceptual documentation on this stuff because there's a lot more to it than this, uh, especially if you run into issues. But hopefully there's some good stuff there. OK. Yep, key rebindings. Uh, you can use add key binding to add them. I think I have some code samples for this one. Let's span a few. OK, yeah, add key press. OK, All right? We have some general boilerplate that we've seen before. And then we have right here, we use the add key press method to pass it a script block that tells you what you pressed. Um, let's run this and, and see what we got. Oops. Let's run it here. Key press, meaning I press keys, right? Tapping the keyboard. OK, simple enough. Um, hopefully, as we go through these examples, your brain is starting to maybe connect how these could be used in tandem to create a dynamic, very helpful app. Uh, again, definitely check out the documentation for more about this. We'll go here. All right, so events in the main loop. And if you've worked with UIs before, um, you may be familiar with the main loop idea, which is where there's a, a loop kind of always running and you interact with that because you have to redraw the interface all the time. And, and I guess it's a common idiom in UI development, which I'm personally not an expert at, but that's a thing. Um, and there's application.run, which is the thing that is responsible for waiting for events. And we'll cover interacting with events in a little bit here. Uh, there's also clicking buttons, which is similar to what we saw earlier with the button clicked method. Uh, or sorry, add clicked method, and you can run some things. And we'll, we'll run this code in just a second, so don't worry if things aren't quite filled in all the way for you. Um, if we look closer, though, at this, there's also some threading going on. You see, on whenever we click on this button, we're starting a thread job. And we're taking 100, 1 or 100, and then we're going through it, and we're updating a label with what number we're on. Let's uh, try running this. Oops. Yeah, let's do it here, actually. Async. All right. So let's start a job here. Oops, I think I have to press Enter. Let's see. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's not supposed to do that. It's supposed to actually start counting. Uh, and it did earlier. So let's see if we can't figure this out live. Why not? Async execution. Get rid of that. Boom, boom. Boom, bang. Let's try this again. Control Q to quit. Fingers crossed. I thought I did save. Looks like it did. Try it again. Ah, honestly, it does work at some point, so have to look at that one. <laughs> um, the general approach of do things in the background, um, but right here is where we want to look. We're looking at, we mentioned the main loop earlier, which is the thing that's kind of constantly running, and that's where we need to interact with. Because we don't want to personally be responsible with like injecting things. We need to work with the main loop 
And the method for doing that is main loop dot invoke, pass it a script block, and it'll do some things. Um, Okay, we showed this uh, earlier, but there's keyboard events, there's all kinds of events. Um, and now to cover the issue where we had to call to string. Unfortunately, this project makes use of instack.uString, which is different than string, and you can't just output it. So you need to use the toString method, dialog.filepath.toString, right? Whatever it is, just toString. Not too big of a deal, but can be really confusing if you don't know that. Uh, and there's a great Stack Overflow thread. I highly recommend if you're trying to work with things. Read through this thread. Very smart people have commented on it who know a lot more about PowerShell than me, including uh, Steve Lee from the Microsoft team. Um, all right, so what's next? Well, hopefully you've seen some cool things here. Uh, some of it is approachable enough that maybe you can implement it in the short term. And maybe in the long term you have some ideas about uh, different ways you could go about building tools that are more extensive than just some filtering or some save dialogues. Um, and ideally, we're going to be having some more people maybe blogging about it, maybe contributing. I think making this an easier situation for others would be great. Um, I'd love to collaborate with someone if you want to bang heads together and, and work on something fun. Like I said earlier, it was a great opportunity working on this. It was a great way to grow. Uh, as a PowerSheller and, and learn new things and really have fun with it. I love the interactive nature of TUIs, and I hope that you spend some time checking it out and uh, enjoy it. Now, I think we have some time. We've got some questions. What's up? Ooh, wow. Do you have the ability to like lock it down and make it so the user has to do something? Um, do you mean like lock down outside of PowerShell? So yeah, those modals, you can pop things up and there's no exit. Uh, there's, I think there is a way to do that, actually. But uh, you may have to do something to make it so Control-Q doesn't get out of it. Um, good question, good question. I've, I can tell you what, if you do things wrong and you don't have the application dot shut down, you're stuck. <laughs> <laughs> you're stuck. So there is, I guess, an unsupported way of doing it. But. Yeah, you could. You definitely could. The question was, when you're using um, out tree view, can you get what you select kind of to be put out? And there are like on click or on key press events you can put, and then you would have to uh, make sure you access that property and output it at the end of the script. Any other? Yeah, go ahead, Josh. Have you visited uh, PowerShell uh, server core? I haven't, but that's a great use case for it, is server core. Um, I think there's like sconfig is a good example of a CLI, TUI kind of thing, but not PowerShell. Hey, Glenn. Oops, sorry. Yeah, this works on Mac and Linux. Yeah, it's on uh, .NET Core. What was your question? Uh, no, I have not. But I, I know some people have done it. I don't know how reliable it is. I'm curious to explore that. And hopefully, uh, as more people use it, maybe open up some good issues and, and stress test things a little bit. Oh, yeah, the question was, does this work well over PS remoting? I am not sure. That's a great question. Is there a way to get MFA to pop up within Terminal? Right, right. I don't know. I, I don't know if I looked into credentials at all or if I saw them as I was looking into it. That's a great question. Yeah, and I think that there's, uh, so the question was about like using MFA and login stuff. And I think that there is a way to make it so the text field or the label is not visible or the characters aren't visible in it. But uh, you know, I, I don't know how much I would trust it or recommend people do it in, in production, but might be something cool there. Any other questions? Awesome. Well, thank you everybody for coming. Enjoy your twoies. <laughs>